Hey, Misconception listeners, before we get started into our first episode, I wanted to talk about Anchor today. Anchor is the podcast platform that I'm using to post my podcast. Uh, It's really cool because A, it's free um, and you get all of the tools that you need to record uh, and, and edit everything from your podcast. You can do that from your phone or your computer. Not only do they distribute your podcast for you, uh, but you can also make money with it. Um, So it's everything you need uh, to make your podcast all in one place. It's super easy. It's free. Um, But yeah, definitely check out uh, the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. I remember what happened was... I, I would try learning these chords and I just could not remember all the weird shapes but my cousin showed me a technique called a power chord and it's a fairly simple shape that you can play anywhere on the neck of the guitar and I started using that to try and play like these songs that I heard from the skateboarding videos and video games and the uh, like ACDC and Sum 41 and I'd say hey check but I didn't own any of that music so I was playing completely from memory and I was like hey check it out I'm playing this and he'd say no that's wrong that's not how you play it and I just kind of got tired of him telling me I was playing everything wrong, so I decided, you know what? I'm just going to make up my own stuff, so he can't (laughs) tell me I'm playing it wrong. Hello, thanks for listening to Misconceptions. The idea behind this podcast is fairly straightforward. I want this to be a journey or look into what people do and how their jobs and careers are commonly misconceived and how we can better understand our people around us. Americans place such a high value on our careers and that doesn't exclude me. Our jobs are our livelihood and they are often how they define us. I want to share my conversations with people in career fields to learn what they do and how that is often misunderstood. I hope you find some value in my conversations with Quincy, a recording artist and music producer. Hello. Uh, Today, my guest is Quincy. I thought of this last night. Quincy is my brother-in-law's brother-in-law, which there is no like familial tie, uh, but it's that's what it is. (laughs) I had to turn to Anna and I was like, "Is Quincy?" And she was like, "No, he's nothing. Like he's nothing to me, like family-wise." But like, (laughs) oh well, thanks. (laughs) (laughs) Not not at all what I meant. But like, in addition to being brother-in-law's brother-in-law, Quincy is a, a musician, music producer, and he's also a videographer. Um, so I'd love to have you introduce yourself and tell me a little bit more about what you do. I'm sure those aren't the only titles that you describe yourself by, but yeah, I'd love for you to kind of explain that. And who, who are you? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, well, I can say you're not far off to begin with because I have a lot of interest. There's a lot of things I want to do and to really simplify it. Like I love music and I love filmmaking. Um, and, but I've since learned that if you're going to pursue a career in something, it's really best to focus on like one thing and not try to do it all at once. I still intend to eventually branch out and do all these other things. And it's interesting. My, my interest in, you know, filmmaking has helped me with, um, with my music career stuff. Like when I go to shoot a music video or something like that, um, those things kind of cross over, but, um, but for the most part who I am right now. Um, my my main gig is giving music lessons. I do give music lessons and then I am, uh, pursuing a career as a recording artist. I write and record my own songs and, um, and eventually I perform those songs that there's a little kink in that with the whole pandemic right now, but I am trying to set up some, um, some live stream stuff. So a buddy of mine, we're going to be, um, doing some performances on live stream soon. Uh, so yeah, that's a bit of what I do. Yeah. i I didn't know that, but now I'm extremely looking forward to that. And that's something I, I didn't actually have that written down to, to ask, but with the pandemic, like being a musician changes a lot. I mean, there's so many, so many aspects that the pandemic can change. And, um, I, but I was curious on like how that works with being a recording artist and, mm-hmm. you know, setting up live streams. And I think I've seen a few artists do that sort of thing. Um, so I was curious on like how that, how that works for you. Yeah, um, I think for the most part, uh, I can say, again, as a musician, the best thing you can do to promote yourself as an artist is playing live shows. I've learned that from past experience with a former band that I had. Um, we started playing live shows and were able to, to kind of get some traction. And the moment we put out an EP, like we got a very good response, like over 200 downloads, which was the most I'd ever gotten at the time. And I was like, 
you know, wow, we, we could do this. Now, unfortunately, that band, we, we were just doing it for fun, you know, and so it kind of dwindled off. Um, but now that that's kind of been my plan to get back into doing live shows. And the plan originally was to do that this year. I was going to start um, playing venues and uh, getting my music out there and, and building up an audience. Um, and then when this pandemic hit, um, it kind of changed things. And I think in some cases there are some benefits. It's, it's definitely challenging, but you have to... Um, you kind of adapt and, and now you're starting to do things digitally. So me and my buddy, we've been setting up for streaming online. Now, thankfully, I think if someone were to do this, like just completely cold with no audience at all, it would be a little challenging. Um, but I have been posting on YouTube for a while. I've been making content over there and um, I make various videos. I do post my music, but I also, I've done a lot of tutorial videos, a lot of lesson videos, um, on various topics all related to, you know, music production and uh, how to actually play a song or, or whatever it might be. Um, and I'll, you know, that I've built up a little bit of an audience over there, although it's still a work in progress. So thankfully I have that where I can start posting videos and kind of let people know, Hey, I'm making content and then let them know, Hey, I'm live streaming. And so some of that audience might come to check out the live streams and that kind of gives us a chance to, to build off of something, you know, to play for someone who might share it, who might get a kick out of it. And, um, and yeah, just continue to start building an audience. That's the most important thing you need as, as an artist is you need that audience. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, if there's no one listening to your music, then you're kind of singing into the abyss per se. Uh, but I, I think that's great. <laughs> I wish I could do that for a living, you know, <laughs> but, uh, it's like, if I want to make, you know, if I want to be able to make all the music I want to make, I'm going to need an audience and uh, I'm going to need, you know, to make some kind of income from it. That's how that works. Yeah. <laughs> from an uneducated perspective, I'd imagine that that's how right. that works. Um, mm -hmm. So as a as a recording artist um, in, a, in, a, in a producer for um, in your experience, uh, what's the question that you're most frequently asked? Um, I think it depends on who's asking the question, because the funny thing is, for the people who know me, I probably get asked most like, hey, can you help me figure out this part? Um, you know, they uh, a lot of times they'll... Do you know how to do this? Exactly. Yeah. Um, I'll have uh, siblings who are trying to learn a song or someone trying to figure out some kind of song part or they need help with an arrangement. And um, uh, I just spend a lot of time with music and I've developed a pretty good ear for it. And so a lot of people ask my opinion or, or for my expertise and that kind of stuff. Um, and then if people ask, uh, you know, maybe randomly just related to what I do, I probably get asked a lot, like, what's the hardest instrument to learn um, or something along the line or what's my favorite instrument to play, which uh, my favorite would be guitar. Um, as far as the hardest to learn, it might also be guitar. It's kind of a tie between that and piano because, you know, on piano, you just need one finger and you push down and you get a sound on from the piano. Whereas on guitar, you've got one hand that you've got to fret with the right amount of you know, with the right position, the right, you know, finger in the right place. And, and then you've got the other hand that you have to, uh, to pick with. And so there's a little more coordination involved with, with getting a sound out of the instrument. Um, so, uh, yeah, those, those are probably the most, you know, the questions I get mostly about that kind of thing. You mentioned teaching and, and, uh, given lessons. Um, so in that same vein, um, do you, would you say that studying music from a young age is super necessary to becoming a musician? I wouldn't say it's necessary, but I think I think like with anything, there's an advantage the sooner you start. And I, I don't know the facts behind this, but I do think the mind works a little bit differently when you're younger. It's still developing. Um, and so I do think at a young age, you have the advantage of when you learn music, it can kind of become normal. You can sort of like develop a really good ear for music and develop a really good sense of timing. Whereas when you're older, if you haven't really spent much time with that, it, it takes, it's a little bit harder to, uh, to develop those instincts. Um, sure. however, you know, it's never too late. If someone really wants to learn an instrument, they can. Um, I've had adult students before. I currently have, um, an adult student and he's doing great. He, um, he just started playing guitar, you know, no prior experience. And he's, he's probably one of my better students. He, he puts in the practice and, um, he's a good listener and, uh, and he, you know, yeah, he, he does the work and sees the results because of it. So yeah, it, anyone, anyone can learn if, if they're willing to put in the work. Oh, that makes me feel better. <laughs> so within that same vein, um, you know, that you really can learn at any age and not necessarily that being uh, a young is being a young age is exclusive to learning. 
Um, but is it possible to teach yourself how to play an instrument? Like, do you need, um, like, is it absolutely necessary to have those lessons to, to learn that skill? Um, I think like if we're talking completely just isolated from any kind of resources, like you just put a guitar in someone's hands and they have to figure out how to play it. I mean, they probably could to some degree, but they would be missing out on a lot. I mean, even just tuning a guitar, you know, knowing how to properly tune it. And that's mm-hmm. not to say that there, there's a standard way to tune it, but there are plenty of people who experiment with different tunings. Um, but that would be really difficult. However, if we just mean kind of like generally, like just not taking official lessons, then it's absolutely possible to teach yourself because I actually taught myself guitar. Now, I did have a background with piano. Um, that was the first instrument I learned, and it was something my, my parents signed me up for it. And I wasn't against it, but it's not like I really wanted to learn piano. It was just kind of something my parents signed me up for, and I did it. Um, but later, when I was about 12, that's when my cousin got me into like rock music and skateboarding. And I was like, oh man, I want to learn guitar. And for some reason, I thought I wasn't allowed to learn guitar because I have a big family. I've got a lot of siblings. And it's, I felt I, I was under the impression that we were all like assigned instruments. My oldest sister, Brittany, <laughs> was assigned piano. And then my two next older brothers, Guthrie and Jacoby, they were assigned guitar. And then I was assigned piano and then the ones under me. Um, and so if I had asked my dad to teach me guitar, he totally would have taught me. But for some reason, I just thought like I wasn't allowed to. So I kind of <laughs> just did it myself. And um, I remember what happened was I I would try learning these chords and I just could not remember all the weird shapes. But my cousin showed me a technique called a power chord. And it's a fairly simple shape that you can play anywhere on the neck of the guitar. Mm-hmm. And I started using that to try and play like these songs that I heard from the skateboarding videos and video games and the uh, like ACDC and Sum 41. And I'd say, hey, check. But I didn't own any of that music. So I was playing completely from memory. And I was like, hey, check it out. I'm playing this. And he'd say, no, that's wrong. That's not how you play it. And I just kind of got tired of him telling me I was playing everything wrong. So I decided, you know what? I'm just going to make up my own <laughs> stuff. So he can't tell me I'm playing it wrong. And uh, and so for like the first three years of guitar, if I wanted to play something, I had to make it up. And uh, in that sense, I I just made a lot of discovery and kind of you know experimented a lot with kind of writing my own stuff. And here and there, I would pick up little tips from other guitarists and those would become sort of new tools for me to experiment with in songwriting and that kind of thing. So, so to that degree, yes, you know, you can totally teach yourself. It's, you don't have to have like formal lessons, but it does help to have some kind of background, some kind of understanding of, of music and how it works. So, uh, so you have some experience with producing, um, I'm sure your own music, mm-hmm. um, but I'm curious on how much time, let's say you're writing a new song, assuming you have, already have the idea for the lyrics and maybe a direction for it musically in terms of uh, you know chord progressions, that sort of thing. Um, in terms of production and recording, like how long does it take an idea from a song into like, here's a file, it's my song, enjoy and, it. Yeah, finished <laughs> song. Um, for me, it probably takes longer than it should. <laughs> That's something I've been trying to work on. Um, yeah, if, if we're talking about a song idea and then we're just trying to figure out the arrangement and the recording, um, it goes faster if once you learn to develop a system and that's still something I'm trying to put into practice, but I do try to put things into phases. So I kind of have, um, I usually try to give myself a month to kind of work things out. So I've, the first week is like the arrangement. So I kind of figure out exactly what the guitars are doing and how they are fitting in with the bass and the drums and just make sure everything's working right, kind of get a sense for the dynamic of the song and and all the vocal parts and stuff. Then the next week, I start trying to record. Now, kind of parallel with all this, I'm, I start practicing my vocals, or at least that's something I've learned recently. I need to practice so that, because vocals are the hardest thing for me to record. So I, while all this is going on, I'm practicing my vocal part, but I start recording the guitars. I change my strings, new strings, And even recording guitars, one thing I've done that's really helped is um, I've been making templates in my recording software. So instead of just starting completely from scratch, I'm able to build off of past mixes. So if I developed a guitar tone that I thought sounded like a finished guitar tone, I can start off recording with settings that get me closer to that finished sound. So that way, when it does come time to actually, you know, mixing the song, Um, it doesn't take nearly as long to to get those polished results. So it's kind of like I did all the hard work on previous projects and now I'm able to kind of 
uh, build off of that to speed up the process. Um, so I have a, a recording week of uh, the guitar parts, bass parts. Um, I'm programming the drums right now, so I don't actually record the drums. They're made in the computer. So usually from the demo phase, um, the drums are pretty much done because um, I just program them right there. Um, then the next week would be the like the mixing week. That's when I would actually start getting the track to kind of sound cohesive and sound a bit more polished, getting everything sounding tighter together and picking like the uh, the final takes. Um, and then ideally the fourth week, once I've got the mix like mostly balanced, and this is um this is just the instruments. Hopefully by then I have practiced and I've got my vocals prepared. So then I'll go record vocals, um, knock that out, and then get those in the mix. And then the last phase is uh, is mastering. So theoretically, I should be able to get a song done in a month, maybe two. But um, but realistically, it ends up taking more like three to six months or something like that. But the other thing I've learned is batching. So here's the interesting thing. That's just one song, but if you work on multiple songs at once, you can kind of, uh, you can speed up that process because you can do a lot of copy and paste. Like probably the longest part would be just the, re the recording. But once you've recorded everything, if you're doing like the same kind of music, you can copy and paste a lot of your settings. Basically, you can get five songs done in the same time that it would take you to do one song. So let's say you're, you know, in a full band, you know, you, there are other instrumentalists, like you've got a bassist, you've got that drummer. Um, how, like, how long does that take in terms of taking that from, you know, a month for one song versus having each instrument, instrumentalist uh, play each of those parts themselves? That's kind of an interesting question in itself, because in some sense, if you're in a band, uh, if you're self-producing yourself, it's probably going to be a similar experience. The only difference is, you know, each person is recording their own part. Ideally, maybe you'd have one person in the band who's kind of more of the engineer. And so if they're the ones sort of scheduling things and kind of taking care of all the technical stuff, then everyone else, they just have to learn their parts and record them. Um, and a lot of times bands, they'll get help from from other people who actually do the engineering. So, um, so like the easiest case scenario would be, if you're the guitarist, you just you just show up, you play your part, and then you let them deal with it. You let the the uh, the mixer, you know, he'll he'll mix it and he'll get it sounding all good for you and stuff. And so, you're really, your only responsibility is to learn the part and play it. That might speed up the process. However, if we go back to the scenario of being a self-producing band, because uh, I've had this past experience too, it can take longer because sometimes not everyone is very good about like rescheduling and that kind of thing and mm -hmm. that was something that i kind of dealt with where you know i'd be ready to go and uh maybe you need the vocalist to to record their part and they have to keep rescheduling like oh sorry something's come up i, I can't do it and maybe next week maybe next week and they just keep saying that and your hands are kind of tied like you can't do anything for that project until they come through and do their part so it's kind of a, a double-edged sword if, right. if everyone's on top of it it probably would go by quicker but at the same time, it can really drag you down. Yeah, and I'd imagine too, like if you're, um, you know, if you're in a a band who is touring and you know recording albums relatively like um, close together, you know, let's say you're putting out an album like every year or so. I, I suppose that being those band members, you know, like this is our full time mm -hmm. job. Like I've got, I'm expected to be here. I mean, just like any other job. And at the end of the day, like being a musician or you know, a, a, a music producer, like it is your job, it's your title. And so let's say you work in an office and you've got your little cubicle or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, you're expected to be there at 9, 9 a.m., 8 a.m. or whatever it is. Having that commitment to the job and certainly to the band, knowing that you're producing, um, I'd imagine mm -hmm. would be super important. That's a great way to look at it because I think a lot of people don't. Because um, most people, when you start a band, they just kind of do it for fun and it is fun and, uh, and that's great. Um, sure. but if you're trying to make an actual career out, out of it, then there is a lot of responsibility and you do have to treat it like a job. Uh, even for me, I have a, a daily schedule, I have a time set aside to work on music. And so that's the time where I try to make sure I'm doing something productive. I'm recording or I'm writing or I'm, you know, making my next video to promote or whatever it might be. Um, but something based on my career and, you know, rather than 
just hanging out on Facebook or watching YouTube videos all day and stuff. It, it could be really hard or it could be really easy to, to go off and do that kind of stuff. Um, but giving yourself that, that time slot of, Hey, these are the work hours. I got to do them. You know, that it, that helps keep you a bit focused. Okay. And so I wanted to kind of wrap back on to something that we were talking about at the beginning of the conversation, how the pandemic has changed so much of what we do. And, and that's the whole idea of the podcast is like, you know, we, we have these jobs and the pandemic has changed those jobs for a lot of people in, in, in some of them anymore. And so that's extremely unfortunate. So with that in mind, I, I was curious on like how difficult it is to be a successful musician. Well, it kind of depends on what you're trying to do because in some ways um, it's the best time to be a musician um, mm -hmm. because there, there's a lot of different routes you can go with, with your musical um, abilities. The, the easiest course like of for making any kind of like financial uh, you know, success is providing some kind of service. So again, for me with doing music lessons, like that, that's been going fine for me so far. Um, and, and that's more of a side gig for me. But if I wanted to do something like that full time, um, a lot of people are stuck at home and they're, they're probably like, Hey, I got time to learn how to play this instrument that I never pick up. And, and so you could do like online lessons and that kind of thing. Um, but if you provide some kind of service where you use your engineering skills to help someone record their music, um, or you help someone, you know, someone has already recorded it and they send you the audio files and you get them mixed and sounding professional for them. There's a lot of service opportunities. Now, if you're trying to be an artist, <laughs> um, it's a little different of a scenario as an artist, you need an audience. Um, that's like the main thing. And there are people again, stuck at home looking for content to enjoy. And so if you can provide, uh, some kind of entertainment and if people connect with your music and connect with your personality then um there are ways there there are ways of making an income as i mentioned before we're looking into the live stream thing i do have you know a, a bit of a strategy we're not just going into this like oh let's let's see what happens you know um the the biggest thing that i'm trying to focus on right now is providing a lot of content and so as soon as this pandemic hit, hit and i knew we were going to go into be doing live streaming I've been trying to take advantage of unfinished songs that I have. So before I've, I've got like, you know, in our set, I've got like five finished songs that we've been practicing. And those were the five songs we were going to take. But now I kind of have this opportunity to um, start doing these playthroughs and no one's expecting like a finished polished product. And so it's like, wait, I can really quickly like take some of these songs and just make a backing track for it. Um, and then just kind of, you know, play along with my guitar, sing along to have a lot of content that I can, put out on a on a consistent basis and um and hopefully develop an audience and once that audience gets to a certain point where they seem very engaged and very um you know excited about what i'm doing that's when you can start looking into more of a uh, um of the business side of things like let's see if there's a way to monetize this probably for me the first thing well the simplest thing you can do is just like a tip jar uh like a virtual tip jar online i've seen some musicians do that and some people are like hey you're great here's some support you know that's the simplest thing you can do um but if you have enough of an audience i'm hoping to connect with that audience and just provide some merch just making a simple t-shirt that that they want to wear something that's like kind of inside the community that they can connect with and say hey here's a reflection of that um and so that's a way they can support me and and project something that they that they they're passionate about um and then there's, you know, services like Patreon where um, people kind of support you so that you can keep making content for them. Um, so it's, it's something I'm still learning a lot about. It's something I'm still exploring because the music industry these days, like you actually don't make much money from the music itself. Um, and so for artists, one thing I've learned about is you've maybe heard this term of creating multiple streams of income. And that's really the best thing that an artist can do. And it takes time to set that up, but you're basically, you don't get all of your money from one source. Uh, the income is coming from a variety of sources and collectively you're able to make a good living on that. And um, But I'm in the same position where there's artists that I appreciate. And if there's anything I can do to... Um, to uh to support them directly it's like i'm gonna do that i even i just recently bought an album from a, a band i like uh called Silosis, and i uh 
I didn't buy it off of, you know, iTunes or anything like that. I bought the actual album from their record labels, uh, you know, website and, and they're like in the UK. So they had to like ship it across seas and stuff, but, but, but I got it and, and I did that just so I could kind of support them. And so any little thing I can do like that to, um, you know, support someone that whose music I enjoy and stuff. Um, yeah, that, that make it makes a difference. Yeah. And that's interesting how, especially right now, um, Patreon, you know, being a, um, sort of a, 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 a monetary support platform where you can offer, you know, different services for different tiers of, of memberships, um, is helped a lot of people, I'm sure in a lot of ways, especially like me being a, a, a listener or, um, the consumer of, of whatever it's being produced. It is, it can be frustrating knowing that like, Hey, I found this really cool band. Like I really like them, but you know, you, you found them on avenues that aren't directly tied to them. You know, maybe you found them on Spotify or you found them on YouTube and, and even might be their YouTube channel, but you know, directly watching their views doesn't, um, it doesn't immediately translate to any financial gain. So knowing that they have, um, you know, the virtual tip dars, like you mentioned, or maybe they have a Patreon or even they have a website where you can say, Hey, here's our PayPal, like, you know, send us five bucks or buy us a coffee or whatever. Um, for me as a consumer, that's really, I don't know if empowering is the right word, but it makes me feel better knowing that like, if I find some, someone that's producing content that I like, that I can support them buy their, buy a t-shirt that's got their, you know, their name on it or, or whatever it is. Well, it's kind of funny that you say that. It's it's sort of relieving to hear that. And I have to remind myself that all the time because it's really weird when you're putting out like your own art, your own work. It's like this expression of yourself. Um, I don't know. It's just weird to think that there's someone out there who might really enjoy it. It almost sounds kind of conceited to think like, you know, oh, you know, oh, this is my music and like, you know, listen to it and like it and stuff. But I just think, like there's artists that have really connected with me. Their music has meant a lot to me and my music could be that same thing for someone else. Um, and so that's, that's a pretty cool thing to think of. And that's kind of a little hurdle I have to get over when it comes to like trying to promote myself. Um, but I, the biggest joy, uh, I mean, I, I just love the creativity of the process. My favorite thing to do in the whole world is songwriting. And, um, which is the whole reason I'm pursuing this to begin with, uh, I don't know. There's just, it's a discovery process every time. It's so fun to just hear a couple notes. Like you might hit them by accident and then just say, Oh, that was kind of interesting. What if I go here? And then just start to explore that idea and see where you can go with it. And you tinker it and try a few different combinations until you find that one that sticks. And it's like, Oh, I like that. And that, that inspires another idea that you then go on to, uh, to explore. And then the next thing you know, you've got a song and, um, that's just, uh, I've just always loved that process. The really cool thing about being in music is all throughout history, like humankind or mankind has always had that element of music, whether it's, you know, just a rhythm, you know, that someone's tapping out or that it's a full blown, you know, orchestra with multiple sections of multiple instrumentalists and vocalists and um, that, you know, the music and the sounds, the chords and everything put together, it makes us like feel things <laughs> that maybe, you know, um, for some people words couldn't. And, and so that's one of the, my biggest joys is knowing that, um, you know, listening to a piece of music and, and hearing something in that music and it, it, whether it's like a chord progression that sounds really cool or it, it's a lyric that speaks to you or that you find, uh, similar to your life. Like there, there isn't an, uh, a physical thing that like you can present to someone and say and feel the same way, you know, um, in my opinion, um, you know, like if I went out and said, you know, I bought a bag of apples or something and said, Hey, here's a bag of apples. Like that's going to be feel different than the feeling of hearing like a chord progression that just hits you or like, you know, hearing a lyric that you've thought of or like in one of my favorite musical artists is, is John Mayer. And it, as cliche as that is, he has a way of putting phrases together that 
that I wouldn't have thought of to say, but yes, I get that. Like he figured out a way to, to use English language or any language and put words together to describe a feeling that I felt, but have never like wrapped my mind around. So that's something that's really cool. And being a, a listener is, I don't have any input into that process, but they have either the intelligence or the music, musical know-how to like put those concepts and thoughts together. Well, absolutely. That's, it's, that's a really good way of putting it. Cause I think of the artists who have impact me, impacted me and, um, it's just like exactly like you said. Sometimes you feel something and you don't know how to describe it, and then someone has this song and it's like, wow, they did it! Like they they're able to encompass this thing that I'm experiencing, and it's just very um, it's very freeing, very I guess therapeutic or, or relieving. You know, it's something about being able to understand how you feel for some reason is there's a there's a comfort and a peace that comes with that, and I think music helps with that. Whatever feeling you have. You know, even even the positive ones, I don't mean to, to make this sound like I just mean like the, the bad ones, but even positive experiences to be able to put that into something uh, of substance like music, um, it just just being able to understand what it is. Uh, it, there's just a good feeling that comes with that. Um, and I've always said, I think music can say what words can't say. Um, there's just so many unique things that you can do with musical notes to, to create really unique um uh feelings like it's not just oh this song sounds happy and it sounds sad it's like this one sounds like i'm saying goodbye to a friend who's leaving or or this song sounds like um you know i'm enjoying a sunny day at the beach or you know there's so many different moods and vibes that you can create with music um and uh and then when someone can is really good with words and they can just phrase those words in, in such a way like like you were saying um it's nice to know that there are people who can kind of take the things that we're dealing with and and put it in a way that's accessible. Because I think it's more than just for us, but also when we could share with other people. It's like, hey, here's a song I really connect with. And, and in turn, that connects us with other people. Yeah, it certainly is very humanizing. And that's one of the one of the greater things about music is people can listen to the same song and, um, you know, either feel the same way or feel differently, you know, about that. And so right, that's right. something that is very complex. Um, and that's something I wanted to mention is, uh, a lot of times music, it it can bring those complex emotions out, you know, that it's not just happy or it's not just sad or, Mm -hmm. you know, like you mentioned the song, the chords that they use make it sound sad. Like it, sometimes it is very basic as that, but also in a lot of times, especially in with modern music, it's not, you know, just happy or sad. It's very complex. There, there's absolutely no way that I would wrap my mind around knowing how to do that. And so that's why as a listener, I'm, I'm glad I'm able to be a part of that experience in, in feeling those things. Right. Um, what is one thing you wish more people knew about being a musician? So when it comes to, um, to, it depends on which people we're talking about. If we're talking about actual like other musicians and or people like just getting into music or they have some kind of musical background, I think I'd want them to know that there's a lot of discipline that goes into it. I think a lot of people sort of get this impression that music is kind of something that you're just born with, either you have it or you don't. And uh, same thing with like having a career in music, like you have to. Um, there's like this, you know, we see it in movies and shows all the time where someone like enters in a competition and they win and it's like, that's it. They're, they're set for life, you know, and that's not necessarily true. Um, a lot of times that happens. They did it. Right. You know, they're in the spotlight for that moment. And then afterwards they don't know how to sustain a career. So they end up kind of dwindling out. Um, there's a lot of, of discipline that goes into knowing your craft Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and, um, but also just, uh, like having a, a, a passion for it. It's not, you know, getting into music is not about, uh, you know, having people look at you and say, oh, look how cool you are. You play guitar or whatever. And I think that's kind of why a lot of people maybe get into it at first. And um, it's just, there's so much more to it than that. Um, it's just a great way of really being able to express yourself and being able to um, to connect with people. And and um, and uh, kind of like we said before, like, you know, for, for the listener, a way to sort of serve them by giving them something that they can connect with. Um, 
And so something along the lines of that, uh, that's maybe not the, uh, most polished answer, but, um, but that's a tough well, question to answer. You know. <laughs> you're talking to me the most, you know, sort of unpolished things. You're talking to me one of the most unpolished people <laughs> that I know. So, which I'm the expert on people I know, so I can say that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Quincy, it's been a pleasure. Um, I I know that you have uh, different uh, places that you would like people to kind of discover your music. So I'd love for you to kind of talk about that sure. uh, real quick as we're finishing up. Sure, I really appreciate that. I've I've enjoyed the the talk and the conversation. Um, for myself, um, I do have a YouTube channel. It's just Quincy Kane Morris, and that's where I primarily post content. Um, I haven't been posting recently because I was kind of had some things in the work, but I've been making a lot of videos lately and I'm going to be starting to post again real soon. And I do have a new single that's actually coming out. So I'll be uh, promoting that and, and posting that soon with a music video and I'll be doing live streams soon. Um, I've been practicing with a buddy. We're going to be doing a test tomorrow and then hopefully doing that soon. It could be as soon as next week, could be a couple weeks, but um, we'll probably stream on YouTube, Facebook and Twitch, I believe are the ones we were looking at. Um, you can find my music on Bandcamp at quincycanemorris.com and, um, and I've got a Facebook page. Uh, don't do much there right now, but I'm trying to work on that. Um, Quincy Kane Morris and, uh, but yeah, primarily YouTube and Bandcamp are, are the, the two main outlets for me. Oh, that sounds great. And, uh, for everyone that's listening, I'll, I'll be sure to include those in the show notes, uh, so that you can support Quincy directly. So, um, Quincy, it's, it's been a pleasure, um, you know, we've we've known each other for a while, and it's it's. I always take something away from from our conversations that we have that I didn't know, and you know, before we started that conversation. So it, it's always a pleasure, and um, I hope to talk to you again soon. Awesome, I've I've really enjoyed it. Thanks, man. Yeah, no problem. All of the links to Quincy's music and content can be found in the show notes. 